Tales from the Break Room is a viewer submission podcast. Send us your scariest work stories at eeriecast.com slash submit. And if we narrate your story, we'll PayPal you three cents per word. Hi, welcome to Dead and Roasted. What can I get you? We had a guy who worked here for a week and tried to mix decaf with regular coffee. Took us 13 days and three employees to finally kill all those grimdoggles that were birthed from the concoction. Oh, uh, what's a grimdoggle? They're vicious little critters that enter our dimension through caffeinated decaf and, you know what, I wouldn't worry about it. Instead, I would be worrying about the stories I'm about to share with you on today's break, featuring a terrible, deadly mixture at a hospital and an entity that enjoys breathing down late night workers' necks. Enjoy. These are tales from the break room. The Breather from E.C. I'm a 30-year-old female living in a big city in Germany. This event happened in the year of 2020, when the pandemic stuff was at its height. I worked, up until now, at a small software company. There are three of us, me, a software tester, my developer, and our management guy. Our office is located in an old spinning mill building. Actually, this spinning mill is a giant building complex with several different companies and shops in it, including two museums and one hostel. Nearly all buildings are made of old red bricks. The windows are gigantic, walls massive, and the ceiling is very, very high. The rooms are huge too. In an empty one, for example in our hallway, you can easily hear an echo of your own breath. Our office is a closed part of an open space, with a thin drywall wall, big plastic inner windows on it, and two huge normal windows on the opposite wall. Now, I usually work at night, due to productivity. My developer, well, he develops, and me as a tester, I run all the tests while he sleeps, so he can see what was wrong directly in the morning and fix it. It also means I'm often alone at work, like really alone. When I do my work, there's usually no one left in the building, not even a janitor or a cleaning staff. Just me, my work, my coffee machine, my laptop, and some monitors. So I would just work, drink coffee, and work some more. It was maybe 4 a.m. one night when the coffee machine ran out of water. I also needed to use the restroom and get some thinking done away from the laptop screen. The bug I was hunting after was very stubborn. I stood up and went outside the office. First, I went to the toilet at the other part of the building. Then I went back to the office, where I grabbed the water tank and went into the kitchen. The open space area was slightly lit up by the moonlight and some running devices like socket extensions or on-off lamps of monitors. It was quiet and peaceful and very much deserted. I knew I was alone there and I was never afraid of it, to be honest. You can be afraid of other people, I get that, but not of empty rooms and discarded devices. That's how I felt. That's how I thought I felt. It's what I told everyone who asked me about working in the office alone at night. So with no fear, no worries, not even a hearsay about anything wrong, bad or let alone paranormal, I stood by the kitchen sink, filling my water tank, and racking my head about that bug. That's when it happened. Suddenly, I felt something touch my neck. Slightly, like some sort of feather or maybe an insect. I touched my skin with my hand and felt nothing, so I brushed it off. I was tired and annoyed, I needed caffeine, and I wanted to go home to my cat and get some rest. Finally get my mind off of work. But it happened again and again and again, and I finally understood what it was. Breathing. Slow, wet, warm breathing. Somebody was standing behind me, and they were standing so close to me, I could feel the air leaving their lungs and the warmth of their moist breath landing on my neck. It scared me to death, really. I was alone. I had nothing with me that could act as some sort of weapon. 
not even high heels or a heavy coffee mug. And behind me was someone potentially dangerous. After all, if they didn't want to hurt me, why did this person say nothing? Why didn't they just wait for me to go back to the office? Why just breathe that close to me? I realized the water was running over the tank. I quickly turned it off and slowly, very, very slowly, turned around. Maybe not the smartest idea, but what should I have done? Stay there forever? Scared and wet with sweat? I really didn't know what I thought would happen next. Was I going to scream or run? But where and how? My legs were shaky already and they were weak. Was I going to hit this person with the water tank? Maybe kick them? I had no idea what to expect. It could be some psycho. Maybe some giant bee or spider like in Lord of the Rings or Harry Potter. But when I slowly turned around and looked, I found no one. Nobody at all. Nothing unusual. Just the table on the low wall. A camera blinking red. Some chairs and an open space filled with all the office stuff. But I could still feel the breathing, now on my chin, then on my lips, like somebody was slowly raising their head. I screamed. I ran into the office, shutting the door closed behind me, hoping that no one was following me. I should have run outside. I knew that, but somehow I didn't. With my luck, I was quick enough to leave this thing outside my office, but I heard it standing outside still breathing. And now I could actually see it standing outside the inner window, a round cloudy blur appearing on the transparent plastic before disappearing. But then it would appear and disappear again and again. This happened for more than three hours without any break or movement to another spot. At 7 a.m., when the cleaning lady arrived, I was sleeping near the heater on the floor. I have no idea how I managed to fall asleep. After that, I never stayed there alone again. Never. I still work at night, but I do so at home and with all the lights on. Work Hangups From Life is Too Scary I work at a small warehouse. That day in particular started as normal as any other day. The warehouse itself holds security systems and did kits for security systems and made air samplers. I was a dock worker, manifester, water spider, and kitter. While I was there, I never witnessed something supernatural there, but something really scary did happen to me. The second time I worked for this company, I was an order packer. When you packed items, you had to weigh each box, load it with fill paper, seal the box, print the itemized list and the weight, stick the weight on the box along with the hazardous sticker and the battery sticker. If we have any issues, we were told to call our supervisor over to help. On this particular day, everyone seemed to be in a great mood, except for the supervisor. When we got our orders, we had to do them in delivery schedule order. My orders in particular seemed to be giving me heck. Each one had different things they needed. Then the weight scale began to malfunction. I was having a pretty difficult time. Now, they had these lights we could turn on, and they would set off a really annoying buzzer alarm. It's supposed to get the supervisor's attention. It sounds kind of like the baggage claim buzzer at the airport. They installed these so we'd have no reason to leave the parking line. The water spider person would bring all the packing supplies, so if we were needing any supplies, we had to use that alarm for that as well. They were pretty serious about us walking off the parking area. I was doing everything in my power to pack this really big order. It seemed every time I'd fix one thing, something else was not working out. As I said, first, the scale was malfunctioning. Then I didn't have enough boxes because each box, depending on the box size, could not weigh over a certain amount. And since 12 volt batteries aren't that big, but weigh a lot, you couldn't pack more than four in a box. I only had two boxes, so I turned on the light and started packing some of the other items. The supervisor came over and turned off the light. He didn't even ask what I needed, 
which he was supposed to do. I continued to work and pack the things I could, then the paper filling machine jammed up, so again I turned on the light. The supervisor came and turned the light off again, still never asking what I needed. So now I needed boxes and the paper machine fixed. I just manually began putting paper in the boxes, which takes a lot longer. Then the scale was malfunctioning again. I turned on the light once more. I looked up and my supervisor looked teed off. He was staring me down. So I turned the light off myself. It was then that I think I hit a nerve. He was trying to grab the orders off the printer as it was still printing. Then the printer began wrinkling up the paper and jamming. He began pulling on the papers. That's when he lost his balance and fell back onto the fan. He was beat red. Everyone was looking at him and began laughing. He became enraged. I was trying to get his attention because the packing line was malfunctioning and before long the boxes were going to get crushed. He yelled at me, cussing at me, asking what the heck I wanted. He continued to just go off, calling me names, asking me what, 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 and I tried to explain that the packing line was jammed up. Then he said he didn't really care. Instead, he decided to keep pulling on the papers as they came out wrinkled. Everybody was still laughing and carrying on except me. I was starting to cry, I was so stressed out and confused. Then he picked up the fan with the stand on it. He swung it right into the printer, hitting it a good 30 times, destroying the fan and the printer. Then he got up in my face, calling me stupid, calling me a baby. Then he said out loud that he was going to go to his car, get his gun, shoot all of us, starting with me. I was crying uncontrollably then. He stormed out of the building. I was terrified. He was the only supervisor on campus, as it was the third shift. HR only usually came in as we were leaving, and that was six hours until then. We got on the phone and tried to call a second shift supervisor, but they didn't answer. Instead, we called the police, and we hid in the picking area, scared he was going to come back with that gun just as he promised. I remember trembling, listening for the door to open, all the other employees hiding as well. My heart dropped when I heard that door open. Everyone tried to calm me down. If it was him, we wouldn't be found, as we had hid ourselves around the shelves. Luckily, it was the second shift supervisor. He'd seen the missed call, so came right in. We practically ran to him and told him why we were hiding. He was apologetic and told us all to go home. He said he would take care of it. When he saw me shaking, more terrified than the others, he asked me why I was taking it so personally. I explained to him that he had pointed me out personally, telling me that I'd be the first person he shot. At the same time, the police finally arrived. I'm just glad the man left and didn't actually come back with a gun. I really felt if I ever ran into him again, he would try to hurt me. He got fired after this incident due to his violent behavior and threats. The police asked if I wanted to press charges. I said not at this time, because I didn't want to pursue someone who chose to walk away. That was honestly the most scared I've ever been at that point in my life. The Gassing of Hospital Hill From Rural Savage The following is a true story of events that took place during my high school years in the mid-1980s. I grew up in rural New England in the mid-1960s through the mid-1980s in a quiet town of about 6,000 residents. For a relatively small town, we had a lot of places for high school kids to find after-school jobs. Three gas stations, two pharmacies, three ice cream parlors, a grocery store, three pizza places, half a dozen restaurants, a couple of craft and supply stores, a fairly large hardware store, surprisingly huge number of antique shops, and the hospital. The hospital was originally built as a private home in the early 1730s and was enlarged around 1900 to become a hotel on the local Boston and Maine Railroad branch line. Once the railroad discontinued the branch line through town and the hotel customers dried up, the property was sold again to a group of doctors and the building became a private psychiatric hospital in the late 1930s. Quick aside, 
The hospital still exists, although these days it is a private detox facility. You can find them up online if you know where to look. When I worked there, the main building of the hospital primarily housed long-term care patients. Not those who needed psychiatric care, really. More folks with dementia or severe cognitive disabilities that made it impossible for them to take care of themselves. A good number of the patients were non-ambulatory and needed wheelchairs or walkers or other assistance to move around. I can't recall exactly how many patients there were, but it was a small facility, definitely under 100 total patients and staff, with the typical variance in staff size depending on day shift or night shift. After school, on weekends, and in the summer, the hospital made use of high school students in the food service kitchen area, with an adult head cook who ran the operation. There were generally four uniformed teenage girls who handled waitressing and who actually interacted with the patients out in the dining room, and who bussed the tables after the patients were done. There was also a cook's assistant and the dishwasher floor mopper cleanup person. At this point in time, the cleanup person was a job that me and my younger brother had, working after school and on weekends on alternating days, so not on the same days. I should also mention that at the time the head cook was a guy called Dave. Dave was a former music student of my dad's when he was a high school teacher in a neighboring town. So while my brother and I didn't really know Dave all too well, he did have a soft spot for us both. Every night before the evening meal, the entire kitchen staff would sit down together and have dinner ourselves. We'd then all scramble for final dinner prep, the dishwasher assisting where needed, and the waitresses would serve dinner to the patients. After evening meal, the waitresses would bust the tables and drop everything on the industrial dishwasher counter, wipe down the tables in the dining room, and go home. The cook and the cook's assistant would bring all the pots and pans over to the dishwasher counter, wipe down their stoves and cooking areas, then also go home. The poor dishwasher would then be there alone for as long as it took, which was usually about two hours, if I recall correctly. That included also wiping down the dishwasher counter and mopping the entire kitchen area starting at the dining room door and walking backwards through the kitchen staff's break area, and so on. Before we get to the actual story, there's one more character to introduce. Iggy. Who exactly Iggy was, patient or staff, we could never get a straight answer. No one from the adult hospital staff would ever answer the question, not even Dave the cook, although it was clear there was more to the story and the adult staff just didn't feel they could share it with the kids. What we could say about Iggy is that we knew he lived at the hospital in the attic. He seemed to be some sort of general handyman. To us teenagers, he looked to be about a thousand years old. He had the unmistakable odor of someone who likely hadn't bathed in a decade, and he took great pains to be sure he was at kitchen staff dinner time every night, right on time, during which he would ogle the teenage waitresses and grumble incoherently while gumming his meal in his completely toothless mouth. So, anyway, the night of the event started like any other. We all had dinner with Iggy leering at the girls as always. The waitresses served the patients and bussed the tables, putting everything on the dishwasher counter. Dave and his assistant cleaned up their cook areas and brought over all the pots and pans, and they all went home. As the cleanup guy and dishwasher, I started in on the dishes, scrubbing the pots and pans, and I had everything done and put away in good time. Then, as always, I filled up the rolling mop bucket using the kitchen hose, adding a generous amount of the industrial floor cleaner we'd always used. Then I got to work on the mopping. Just as I finished mopping the kitchen staff break area, I was about to start on the actual kitchen floor. That's when Iggy walked in through the side door. This was unusual and something he'd never done before when I mopped, but he had the run of the place and always carried a huge set of keys on his belt so I didn't really think anything of him unlocking the door and coming in. Iggy stared at me for a moment, but then he said, Good thing I caught you, boy. I've been getting all kinds of complaints about the crappy job you've been doing on the kitchen floor. Obviously, this was news to me, and I told him that. But he replied, It's that, Dave. He's too easy on you, and you're slacking off. Wait here. And with that, he stormed off back out the side door. 
He was back in under 30 seconds, handing me a second bottle of industrial cleaner. He said, Pour in a good amount of that, then finish the floor and make sure you get it good and wet and scrub it real good. So what was I supposed to do? He was an adult and apparently employed by the hospital, and I was just some high school kid doing a part-time job. So I did what I was told. I poured in some of the new cleaner until he said, That's enough. Then I mixed it around in the bucket with the mop. Once I'd done that, he took the bottle back, nodded once, and reminded me, Make sure you scrub it real good. Get it good and wet. He then exited again out the side door, back into the hospital corridor. So at that point, I did what I was trained to do. I mopped the kitchen floor as I'd done dozens of times before, always walking backwards towards the kitchen door, which was currently propped open to let some air in, as the kitchen didn't have air conditioning and could be stifling in warm weather. I noticed then that the mix I was putting on the floor was a slightly different color than normal, but I didn't notice anything else. I finished the job, dumped the mop water outside, put away the mop and bucket, locked up the kitchen door, and got on my bike, making my way home on the other side of town. At that point, it was 8pm and everything was wrapped up. Due to a number of appointments, both my brother and I would be off from the hospital for the next few days, and one of the adult daytime staff was assigned to provide dishwasher coverage while we were away. After about four days, I ended up being the first of us to work again. I rode my bike to the hospital that evening to clean up from the dinner mill shift. On arrival, I was immediately grabbed by the arm and hauled outside by Dave, who looked me in the face and yelled, What the hell did you do? Obviously, I had no idea what he was talking about, so I told him that. He asked me to describe my last work shift. I told him the same story I've described here. As understanding dawned, I saw his eyes shift and then go real sad. He then said to me very quietly, Never take anything from Iggy. Make sure your brother knows this too. He then told me what happened. Apparently, at 2 a.m. that night, a passing hospital staffer had smelled something unusual coming from the kitchen. They got security to unlock the side door. They were both then assaulted by a noxious cloud of chemicals that burned their eyes and noses. Fearing the worst, they pulled the fire alarm, which caused an immediate evacuation of the building, forcing all patients and staff out into the night while the fire department swarmed all over the building trying to figure out what was wrong. After venting out the kitchen, not being able to find any cause for the fumes after four hours of looking, they could only conclude it was some sort of industrial spill. The fire department cleared them to bring the patients back in. The kitchen was shut down for several days to be thoroughly scrubbed by a commercial cleaning company while the patients were fed takeout food at enormous expense. Everyone assumed it was my fault somehow. This being the 80s and our town being the model of small town America, they left it to Dave to talk to me, rather than rushing to immediately have me arrested on the spot. Turns out whatever Iggy had given me had mixed with the cleaner in the bucket it had literally created a toxic gas. I must have never noticed it because I was walking backwards away from it the entire time, and the kitchen door was open allowing clean air in. Once the door was locked and the kitchen was bottled up for the night, it became a toxic soup. Looking back at it over the years and making educated guesses about the different contents of the two bottles of cleaner, it's very likely that the mixture that was in the bucket would have been extremely deadly if someone had inhaled enough of it. Obviously, I was blameless. I kept washing dishes at that hospital for another year, until I moved on to my first computer industry job, then on to college. My brother kept working there another two years until he also left. Iggy still showed up for every meal, right on time, ogling those high school girls. Creepy Men on Dirt Roads From Taylor I previously worked and lived at a ranch owned by my aunt and uncle. At the time this happened, my cousin had come to visit for the weekend, 
and wanting to have a few drinks that night, we decided to drive to the nearest town, which is about 40 minutes away to pick some up. We also ended up picking up a friend of ours who lives in the town, after the three of us headed back up to the ranch. Part of the drive is along the highway before you pull off onto a side road, and for the rest of the drive it's down a gravel road, one that has always felt as if it took hours to drive along. I've been down this road plenty of times. I'm very familiar with the road and most of the people that live along it, but I'm still pretty new to driving and only drive alone when I absolutely have to. I'm still very thankful that this wasn't one of those times and that people were with me. It terrifies me to think about what could have happened that evening had I been driving alone. Unfortunately, my family's ranch was the last property before it's just an empty road where we don't get a lot of traffic other than the occasional trucker. It was starting to get quite dark, and we were at the last few kilometers before our turnoff when we suddenly passed a truck that I almost didn't even notice. The truck had been parked there on the side of the road. It was turned off. Now, I'm a naturally paranoid person, so I tried not to think much of it when I saw the lights to the truck come on and the truck started. The driver suddenly pulled out and turned onto the road behind us, coming our way. It's a pretty quiet road, and other people do live along it. I also didn't get a good look at the truck, so it very well could have been someone we knew. So I tried to ignore my paranoia. Plus, we were almost to our road, and we were excited to sit around the fire pit, enjoying a few drinks and each other's company. As we laughed and argued over who should get to decide on the music, all of a sudden we saw flashing red and blue lights, like the ones on a police vehicle behind us. My stomach instantly dropped. As I said, I'm fairly new to driving, but I do know that I hadn't been doing anything wrong. Also, I was confused as to why there would be a cop just sitting way out here so far from town. But I panicked, and I felt confused. I pulled over and waited for them to pull up behind us. I was surprised when instead of pulling up behind us, the truck pulled up right next to our vehicle. It was then that I could clearly see two men who were at least in their 50s. I didn't recognize them as anyone that lived along the road. The truck they were following us in was not a police vehicle either. It was a red truck with lights they could have easily just bought and slapped on top. I felt instant dread. The men had been laughing as they pulled up. It could easily have been just them messing with us, but the way they looked at us made chills run up my spine. If it was a prank, there were other people on that same road who had passed us earlier. They could have stopped them. But no, they sat there waiting for who knows how long and chose the vehicle with three young women in it. I could have been wrong, but something about the whole situation just didn't feel right to me. The only thing they said to us was, Have you ladies been drinking and driving? I answered no, still very confused as to what was going on. My friend, who was a bit more confrontational than me, told them to mind their own business. After sitting there for what felt like forever, they finally just drove off, laughing. I just sat there for a few moments, scared, as my friend and cousin tried to reassure me that they were just messing with us. When I finally pulled myself together, we continued on down the road, it was only about a minute or two later when we got to the last hill before our turn, and just as we were getting to the top of the hill, my stomach sank again. This time, I was in full panic mode, because parked in the pullout just before the road we were supposed to turn on sat the same red truck that had pulled us over. Now, because the pullout was so close to the road, I had no choice but to slow down right next to them. There they were with the same creepy smile staring back at us. I turned onto our road, hoping they would be tired of messing with us now and just leave us alone. But sure enough, they began to take the same turn right behind us. I stepped hard on the gas, racing to the driveway as fast as I could, my heart beating out of my chest. 
Unfortunately, my aunt has had problems with people stealing in the past, so now she kept a gate at the end of the driveway, locked, which meant someone had to get out of the vehicle to open it, then close it behind us. We made it with just enough time to get through the first gate, before they could have a chance to try to follow us even further. And as my cousin was closing the gate behind us, the men drove by so slowly, I could still see them smiling and laughing. They had no reason to follow us down that road either. It's a dead end. They wanted to follow us, whether it was to mess with us or for another reason. I don't even want to know. What I do know is that I haven't seen that truck or those men again since that day. How did she leave? From Sanderson 550. I took a security job while I was in college, since it was easy work and gave me plenty of time to complete assignments while getting paid. As a part-timer, I had a regular post, but I would also fill in at other sites for extra hours. One day I was asked if I could cover a call-in at a real estate office downtown. I agreed since it was third shift in the place at Wi-Fi. I arrived at around 8pm and relieved the supervisor who was covering until I got there. The buildings were old and three stories. I only had to monitor the real estate offices on the first floor. Piece of cake. At or around 21.35, I heard typing. I saw one of the offices along the wall had a light on. But I didn't see or hear anyone come in. So I went to the office to find a young lady typing on an old style manual typewriter. I tapped on the doorframe and introduced myself. She stopped typing and smiled telling me she was just finishing up some things before she went on a trip. It was odd because she was somewhat dressed up. Not what I usually see when an employee comes in after hours to tie up loose ends. I asked for her name so I could log her presence and the encounter in my hourly report. She gave me the name of Elise Gumble. I thanked her and added that she should let me know when she leaves so I could log her exit too and that I would also escort her to her vehicle in the dark parking lot. She smiled and thanked me, and she even said I was a doll. I don't know why, but that just struck me as odd. So I went back to my schoolwork at one of the desks. A bit later, I went to the restroom and noticed Miss Gumbel's office light was out, and the door was shut. I noted the time as about 22.55. I went to the exit to see if she was in the lot, However, I saw no car but my own. I simply assumed she had left. I noted her departure in my log and sat back down. At about 23.20, I was startled by the sound of typing again. I looked up and the office door was closed, but the light was on. How did she get back in without me knowing? More annoyed this time, I went to the office and knocked on the door. The typing stopped. Miss Gumbel? I inquired through the door. There was no answer. So I opened the door and noticed something that made my hair stand on end. There before me was a modern office setup, complete with a computer monitor, keyboard, printer, and fluorescent lighting and a drop ceiling. And more important, no typewriter. No Miss Gumble. I looked around. I stepped back and called for her. There was no way she could have exited that office, just as there was no way she could have entered the building without me noticing. I called the dispatch over the radio. Then I wasn't sure what to tell them, so I asked them to call me at the site. Just then a supervisor called over the radio advising that he was in the vicinity and that he could stop by. A few minutes later, he arrived. After explaining the odd events that just transpired, he nodded and said, I'll be damned. He explained that the company just obtained this contract just over a year ago. The first guy who worked this site quit mid-shift with a similar story. The guy who replaced him left a day later, stating another similar story. But he came back and didn't have an issue until last night when he encountered Miss Gumble again and called it off which then required my service tonight. Long story short, I did some investigating. Back in the 1920s, this building was a small textile factory. 
I also found a grave online for Elise Anna Gumbel, who died July 6, 1925. She was just 27 years old. I couldn't find any other details. My best guess would be that she may have worked as a secretary or even in management at the textile plant. Given her age, she may have died tragically in an accident over the holiday. She did tell me she was going on a trip after all, and it seems that she only makes her appearance around the first week of July. She's pleasant and friendly, but very unnerving for those unprepared for her late night visit. Since then, I usually visit her grave and place a flower there for her. I let her know that if I ever work that location again, she's always welcome to visit. But since then, I graduated, and I found a career, and I never saw her again. Tag Ripper Tom from Archer About a decade ago, I was a young, newly married woman whose husband was away on deployment. During the time, I lived alone. So in order to make the days and months go by faster, I took on more shifts at my job and just worked as much as I could to stay busy. While working in a big department store, it wasn't difficult to find extra shifts. Every day, there was at least one person that called in sick or simply didn't show up. After a few months of filling in around the store, I made the move to a completely different department when a better position opened up. While I did enjoy my old team, our team leader was a walking disaster and I just couldn't stand them anymore. They were the kind of boss that would criticize how we completed store tasks like printing and signing merchandise while not knowing how to operate the program that printed out our signs in the first place. When I began working in the men's department, I was really happy with the change. My old boss was way on the other side of the store and my new department was close to the mall entrance. So when we had customer appreciation events, like handing out candy during Halloween or balloon making during the 4th of July, I was close to the excitement. Overall, my experience working with the customers in this department was more pleasant, not to mention easier than any other department I'd been in. So if someone was looking for a dress shirt for a wedding, I would pick out a few nice examples that were less formal, and even some trouser options that would complete the look. Living on Oahu, a lot of people attend events that require aloha attire. I think if you aren't used to navigating the bright and strange world of Hawaiian shirts, it can be intimidating and overwhelming. Another situation I enjoyed helping with was when families were shopping for a funeral in order to dress the deceased loved one. Sure, that sounds weird to hear. It sounds strange when I say it out loud. But there's something really rewarding in being able to help someone find a complete outfit to dress their dearly departed in. I remember one customer. She was an older woman who had mobility issues. So I had her sit by the cashier station and describe to me what she was looking for and what sizes she needed. I brought different options to her and in the end, she quickly decided on a charcoal suit with a deep blue dress shirt, navy socks, and navy underwear. I'll never forget how thankful she was that everything was so fast and simple. Along with all the great customers though, there was a handful of terrible ones. I think every store has their own set of terrible customers. The difference comes down to how the stores themselves choose to handle them. This customer, who I'll call Tom, was one of those cases where if the upper management or even loss prevention store security had stepped in sooner to handle him, I don't think he would have had the chance to harass almost all the women in the store. The first time I met Tom was in the suit section of our department. He was looking through a rack of clearance dress pants and asked for some assistance with finding his size. During the interaction, he told me that he was homeless and that he was looking for a nice shirt and slacks to go on job interviews in. Tom was a very tall and broad man in his late 50s, so I knew the size he was looking for was in a different area, the big and tall section. After we got there, he was able to find two pairs of dress slacks and a few shirts that were all on clearance. Tom was really happy with his purchase and I felt good about being able to help another customer. When he was leaving, Tom said that I was the best and that he'd look for me every time he needed help. He said it in such a positive manner that I didn't find it strange. It didn't feel strange or creepy at the time, just positive. About a week later, I saw a sticky note with Tom's name and phone number on the bulletin board we keep in the back. 
It wasn't unusual to take customers' phone numbers in order to call them back when we got a specific item back in stock. I asked the department manager about the note, and she said that Tom came in during the week looking for me, but she ended up helping him for over an hour with dress slacks and shirts again. When I told her about the last purchase I helped him with, we just figured maybe he got the job he interviewed for, and he was now buying extra dress clothes since he knew they were on sale. I didn't think much about it until that weekend. On Sundays, I usually came in early to change all the signs in our department. This shift was special because it was 6 a.m. to 10 a.m. We got to leave early, but had to clock in three hours before the store opened, and work without air conditioner. Around 9 a.m. when the store opened, I was double-checking my signs when I noticed Tom walking in my direction. We made small talk for a few minutes until he asked me if there was anything new on clearance. I pointed him in the direction of some plain, single-color, short-sleeved t-shirts that had been reduced a second time. The brand was probably getting rid of that type of shirt because they'd gone down to about three bucks each. Tom seemed really happy with this and went through each color looking for his size. With only about 10 minutes left before I was able to clock out, I escorted Tom to the cash register and proceeded to check him out. Sometimes on busy mornings, it helped to waste a little time by jumping in with the cashiers and checking out a few customers. While I was scanning his shirts, Tom asked if I could double bag the shirts. He explained that the bags were really useful to have and they also kept his clothes dry since he had some storage issues. Feeling great about helping Tom again, I folded the shirts he purchased and double bagged them for him. No problem. The problem arrived when we were waiting for the machine to approve his credit card. While he looked down at the machine, he said, You know, you remind me of someone. Gosh, why can't I remember her name? Not really thinking about it, I just handed him his receipt and started to tell him to have a nice day when he interrupted me and said, Oh, Betty Boop, that's who it is. You remind me of Betty Boop. Oh, uh, that's interesting. I blurted out, feeling completely caught off guard. Yeah, did you know she was a sex symbol in the 30s? He added with a degree of huskiness that made me so uncomfortable that I said goodbye and just went to the back of the store to clock out. I told my department manager about it, and she said she'd keep tabs on him since it seemed like he was coming in often. I changed my schedule and forgot about Tom for a little while. Maybe a month later, I was standing in line buying rabbit food when I heard a familiar voice behind me say, You look different when you're not in your work clothes. It was Tom. Caught off guard, I really didn't know what to say, so I just replied with, Yep, it's uh, my day off. And I turned back around. I quickly paid in cash and ran to my car. I know he wasn't following me, but I still took the long way home and cut through a lot of back roads along the way just in case. When my department and floor manager were talking about Tom a few days later, I brought up that I saw him outside of work and how weird it was. To their credit, they both took me aside and seriously asked me if I thought he was stalking me. And I don't believe that he was. It was weird that we were in the same checkout line, but other than being creepy, what else could be said of the guy? What else could I say he was guilty of? So I told my managers that I didn't want to help him when he came in. Then they scheduled me in the women's department for a few weeks. While I wish I could say that it ended there, it didn't. Working in the women's department was a short-term relief to a problem that was still ongoing. My department manager said that she was dealing with Tom when he came in to try to defuse his presence. After he had repeatedly gave her his number under the guise of checking in on inventory, he asked her for her personal number to contact her directly. When she told him that he could always reach her with the store number, he tried to file a complaint against her, saying that she had bad customer service. I think when Tom realized he wasn't getting as much attention as he used to, he decided to shift his tactics. Instead of asking a lot of questions about clothing items, he would take them into the fitting rooms and rip off all the tags, then stand in line to pay for them. By ripping off the tags, he ensured that the cashiers had a hard time scanning the clothes and had to call for clerks like me in order to find out the prices. Looking back on it now, I think he did this so more people had to help and tend to him when he was in the store. In one incident, when I was back working on the men's side, 
I had to price check a few belts that Tom was trying to purchase. Not wanting to go there in person, I called the cashier over the phone. She said that she had a customer with four belts and no tags, and that the customer said they're all on clearance. I checked on the belts she described to me and tried to handle the matter over the phone, but it was beginning to escalate the longer I refused to walk there in person. So I called for a manager and then got the exact belt Tom was trying to buy, and I brought it over to the cashier station. Tom was really upset when he saw me. He put it together that I was the person on the phone who obviously didn't want to be there in person. He started yelling. Oh, I see how it is. You and Cheryl playing games. You only want to talk to me and be nice to me when you're on the clock, huh? I see how it is. Cheryl is my department manager. Luckily for me, by this time, our store manager arrived and I handed the whole situation over to him like a dirty diaper. The next morning before the store opened, we had a small floor meeting about what happened and the whole situation with Tom. It was there that I found out Tom liked to hang out in the shoe department as well, and many of the shoe sales clerks had similar stories. And the cashiers that had to help Tom check out reported that he liked to chat them up too and tried to invite many of them to lunch. They only started to make complaints about him when he began to ask for their personal information. What resulted from this meeting was having the undercover security guards walk around the floor more often. I don't know if Tom picked up on this or not, but he broadened his scope to the rest of the store, so no one could accuse him of targeting one particular person. Amongst other reasons, I quit that year. Even though I didn't work there anymore, I was still connected to my coworkers on Facebook where they could complain every few weeks about Tom. Even a year later, he was still roaming the different departments, trying to chat up female employees, making them uncomfortable, then getting upset when he was rejected. Before he finally disappeared, he had a big incident in the jewelry department. Apparently, he asked the associate there to show him various pieces of men's accessories, then tried to ask her which pieces she liked. Thinking he meant which pieces did she think would make a great gift, she pulled out a few rings and bracelets for him to look at. When she was trying to show him the different watch face sizes against her own wrist, he stopped her and complimented how nice her skin was and how she had the perfect hands to work in jewelry, that such nice hands deserve a nice watch like that and that he could buy it for her if she wanted him to. My insides cringed when I heard about all that. I can't imagine how that woman felt put on the spot while she was just trying to do her job. From what I heard, the next associate put all the jewelry away, and when Tom started yelling, the store security called the police. I don't know what happened to Tom after that. Sometimes I wonder if he moved on to bothering the female associates in Macy's or maybe Target. Creepy Customer from Joey D. I was a 20 year old guy, a six foot one with dark hair and an average build. A few years back, I was working for a local convenience store in York, England to pay for my university rent and bills. Our store was the last one open that late, midnight, and on Fridays, we would often get drunk customers on nights out, coming in five minutes before closing taking their sweet ass time to leave, delaying our ability to close up shop and go home. One Friday I got to work at 4 p.m. and half an hour into the shift, our store manager and staff supervisors went into a meeting in the tiny office at the back of the shop. I was restocking shelves when I heard the double bell for my colleague on the tills. A double bell is for a manager and knowing they were stuck in a meeting, I went over to help, noticing there was just one customer at the tills. I also quickly noticed my colleague looked stressed. I walked up in front of the customer and asked if I could help. My coworker leaned closer and whispered that he didn't feel comfortable serving the customers. The guy was clearly drunk. He was trying to buy a large bottle of cheap wine and you could definitely smell alcohol on him. I kindly explained to the customer that we were not able to serve him at this time. The guy stared into my eyes and quietly whispered, please. I replied that we were not able to sell him alcohol at that time. After much awkward silence and eye contact, this guy just staring deadpan into my face, 
he grabbed the bottle of wine and swung at me, narrowly missing my head and bringing the bottle down hard on the baggage shelf. He hit it so hard he dented the part of the counter where people put their baskets full of shopping stuff. How the bottle didn't just break, I have no idea. But that could have been my head. I probably would have died, or at least be in a coma. My colleague on the till grabbed the bottle and pulled it away from him. The panic not quite having set in, I calmly repeated the man would need to leave. He storms off past me, and as I followed to make sure he left the store, he spun around asking if I was religious. He pointed a finger to my throat, saying the KKK would come after me. He then turned and walked out the store. As soon as he left, I started to feel sick. My legs were shaking. I laughed it off and went back to the shelf I was stacking. Shortly after, the manager and senior members of the team emerged from the back office. Upon telling them what happened, they said they already knew, as they had seen the events transpire through the store's CCTV camera. I asked them why they didn't come to help. They said they wanted to see what happened. Needless to say, I wasn't working there very long after that. We saw quite a few sites working late at night on a Friday in the busy city with two universities. But nothing came close to nearly being knocked out or worse by an angry drunk wielding some cheap wine. Hostage Situation at Work From Nick F. This story took place about a decade ago in Glasgow, Scotland, specifically in a beauty salon in the city's West End. For obvious reasons, I won't reveal the name and location of the salon. However, it was late autumn, so the light faded early, and it was dark by about 5 p.m. My two friends, for the purpose of this story I'll call them Neelam and Aisha, were working one day, and were just about to close the salon for the evening. Suddenly, three masked men came in with plastic shopping bags. They said they were looking for the salon owner, and when they were told that she was not in the store that day, they closed down the shutters. Neelam was obviously scared, but also thought they seemed fairly amateurish and harmless, until they pulled out hammers and a roll of duct tape from the bag. They marched Neelam and Aisha to the back of the salon, where they proceeded to bind their hands behind their backs, then put tape over their mouths. In reality, the whole situation lasted for only about 10 minutes, but it felt so much longer, as things looked as though they were beginning to turn more sinister. The men began smashing some of the inside of the store, using their hammers to break the cash register and also the phone. For whatever reason, they didn't actually steal anything. Then they decided to just leave while Neelam and Aisha were left out in the back of the store. After struggling for some time, they used a pair of hairdresser scissors to cut the tape from their wrists, and once they removed the tape from their mouths, they used their phones to call the police. Although they were unharmed, they both say this was the single most frightening thing to ever happen to them, and to this day, they do not know why those men wanted to see the owner so badly. They could guess it was something that was best being kept out of, so they quit the salon shortly after. As far as we know, the men were never caught. However, my friends did have to attend identity lineups, although they could never identify anyone, as the actual men had been wearing balaclavas during the incident. They were grateful the owner wasn't there that day, as they're certain the men had very bad intentions for her, and this scary situation could have been much, much worse. It stared at me from the dark, from days and dust, I work for a three-floor house museum that is rumored to be haunted by some of the former residents, a belief that I myself now share. I had seen some things before around the house, white wisps darting into rooms, the sounds of voices or walking on the floors I wasn't on. Hell, I've even had my bag tugged by some unseen force. I tend to embrace whatever our spirits here give me, it's silly, but when I'm alone, I do talk to them. I see them as friends, sometimes even colleagues. None of my experiences ever bothered me, as much as the encounter I'm about to share with you. Even now, I'm getting goosebumps just thinking about it. 
It was a Friday, and we had a paranormal investigation group come to walk around the museum for a few hours. Nothing too out of the ordinary. We've been having groups come in for the past year, usually recurring groups, but this group was new. There were four of them, and they were really nice. They even took me along, giving me a camera to hold, explaining things as they went along, so that I could understand. It was pretty cool to be honest, and it made me feel like I was an actual investigator. There were five of us going through the house, and for the most part, all we really got were a couple of voices. The spirit box did go off quite a few times, but nothing too overly exciting. This wasn't beyond the usual. A lot of the evidence other groups tended to get were voices. But you could tell these guys were a little disappointed. After a few hours, we headed up to the third floor to investigate there. The lead investigator, Dave, asked me if I could shut off all the lights. He explained they wanted to do an experiment. He wanted us to sit in the dark and see, once our eyes were adjusted, if we could get anything to interact with us. I obliged in excitement, turning off every light and soon joining them upstairs in one of the kids' bedrooms. It was a pretty fun thought, getting to interact with some of the ghosts here. Now, the doorway I sat in front of was connected to two hallways. The first, if you went straight out of the room, would lead to a couple of other rooms, and to the main stairs at the end. The other hallway to the left went down a wall of paintings and photographs towards the servant's staircase and another bedroom. All the window shutters were closed on this floor, so it was pitch black. The only light was the occasional flicker of the fire alarm that would briefly light up the ceiling of the hallway. Sitting in the doorway, I stared down the hallway in front of me, the one going towards the main staircase, and for five or so minutes I sat there in darkness. Eventually, someone from the group behind me started to comment on seeing a woman in white down the hallway, something that I just didn't see. I started to get annoyed after a while, thinking they were just messing with me. After a few moments, though, after squinting in the dark in front of me, I feel the sudden overwhelming urge that I'm being watched. I turn my head briefly towards the hallway to my left, and I stare there for a moment seeing nothing but inky blackness. I went to move my head, thinking I was fooling myself, when I realized something. I watched as the fire alarm light blinked, and instead of seeing the portraits on the wall, all I see is a giant black mass. My stomach dropped when I saw it, especially at how massive this shadow seemed to be. The ceiling on this floor is about 10 feet tall, so this shadow had to be at least 7 or 8 feet tall. It barely reached the top of our painting exhibit racks, which are a little over 8 feet tall, I think. It stood maybe 5 feet away from me, just staring. I couldn't see any features of it, but I could just feel its eyes on me. I whispered to Dave that there was something in that hallway, but he and his crew were too busy whispering behind me about the lady they were seeing. One of the investigators closest to me, Mary, soon grew very quiet. I don't know if she saw what I saw, or just got sick of sitting in the dark, but she quickly flicked on her flashlight and announced that they were going to take a break. I turned mine on as well and shone it down that hallway, but there was nothing. I told the group about the thing in the hallway, and in excitement, Dave said that I should try communicating with it this time if it returned. They turned the lights out again, and after ten minutes I started to feel that sensation once more, but this time the blackness was only a few feet away. Once again, I couldn't make out any features. This time, however, it was close enough that I was sure I could clearly see the large shadow in the darkness. At the prodding of Dave earlier, I had hesitantly sat down this time with my legs outstretched one towards where the shadow now stood. I asked it to touch my ankle in a shaky voice, starting to lose my cool as I watched it move towards me. I could make out what looked to be a large hand with long fingers coming from the mass. I could feel the cold as it had started to move towards my ankle. It was slow, agonizingly slow, as if it were in slow motion. This time, though, I think Dave saw it too. Just before the shadow could grab my ankle, he quickly turned on his flashlight 
and announced that the experiment was over. That was that. We turned on the lights and explored for a bit longer in the light until the investigation was done. I still work at that museum, and I haven't seen the form since then. Dave said that sometimes ghosts try to take on bigger and scarier looking forms to intimidate the living, while some of the other investigators claim that it might have been a shadow person. I personally don't know what it was or what its intentions were at all. I go to that part of the house quite regularly with tours and I've never witnessed anything like it during the day. I wonder if it was trying to communicate with me that night or if it was just curious as to why a living person was there that late at night to begin with. Whatever it was, I still do feel its stare sometimes when I'm alone. It used to be only on the third floor, but now it seems to have followed me to my office on the second floor. I always find myself looking up towards the stairs when I get that feeling, but I never see anything. If anyone has any ideas on what this could be, let me know. I'm open to any ideas, but to be honest, I'm not sure if I want to see it again. But maybe my curiosity is getting the better of me. All I do know is that the day I see an eight-foot-tall shadow mass in the middle of the day, that's the day I'm quitting. Spark and I Saw Hell From Matthew I live on the border of Virginia and West Virginia. It's a beautiful place here in the Blue Ridge Mountains. I started working for a tree clearing service. We had to go up to West Virginia and clear out a hillside for a gas line they were installing. We got up there and got to work. There were houses close to this hillside. After laying down a few trees, we got to one we were worried might hit a house, so we decided to use a cool called a come-along to pull it in the direction we wanted it to fall. We hooked up two of them to two different trees, running ropes up to the tree. I had never done this before, so all I was told was when it fell loose in my hands to step back from the come-along. My rope was run through another tree. As I started to crank, the man in the bucket truck began to cut the tree, and when I felt it get loose, I stepped back. Well, with that rope through the other tree, when the tree fell, it yanked that come-along up in the air, and it hit me right in my jaw. It threw me about five feet in the air, and I came down on my head. I was severely dazed. It took me a minute to get control of my body again. I had a severe concussion. Finally, when I sat up, I could tell half my face had been crushed in, and I was severely bleeding. I stayed calm, but the other guys around me began to panic. They had never been in a situation like this. I just kept saying I needed to get to the hospital as I kept spitting out blood. Finally, I got the boss to take me down to the hospital after he found a towel so I didn't get blood all over the truck. We made it to the hospital, and I was immediately taken in every doctor and nurse working on me. I had them call my girlfriend because she was the closest to the hospital. When she made it there, I was barely hanging on because of all the blood loss. I had cut an artery in my face, and my jaw had been completely shattered. They were going to med-flight me out and put me under to slow the blood loss. Then my girlfriend asked how long I would be asleep for. Maybe just a few hours? The doctor replied, probably a few days. That's when I started freaking out, truly realizing how close to death I was. But they put me under, and they put me on a ventilator. They med-flighted me out to Roanoke for emergency surgery to stop the bleeding. During that time, I had an out-of-body experience. I remember seeing nothing but complete darkness. I tried to move, but I couldn't. It felt as if every nerve in my body was on fire. Then I noticed the sounds... They were truly horrifying. The pain, the torture, the endless suffering I heard around me was like nothing Hollywood has ever come up with. Then I felt this presence coming towards me. I could feel the hate and maliciousness coming from it. I just wanted to run, but I couldn't do a thing. I began to think this was my fate, that in life I had been a terrible person, and I began to ask for forgiveness. As I did that, a beautiful white light started to shine in front of me. In that light stood a man. I couldn't see his face, but I could see he was wearing white clothes. 
He reached out his hand towards me, and with everything in me, I reached out for his hand, grabbing it. At the same time, something grabbed my ankle. That's when I woke back up, still hooked to everything, still on the ventilator. My girlfriend was in the room. She was so happy to see my eyes open, to know that I was going to make it. The hospital staff were freaking out, afraid I was going to start pulling things out of me. I was just happy to be alive, to be honest. They put me back under and did the second surgery to restructure my jaw. I was in the hospital for a couple of weeks and had a while to recover, but I can only say the place I saw was down under and I was saved by a righteous man. After these events, I seem to have more abnormal things happen to me, and to this day, I'm just happy I didn't stay in that place. Tales from the Break Room is a viewer-submitted podcast featuring allegedly true scary stories that happened on the way to, on the way from, or at work. If you want your story to be narrated on the show, send it to us at eeriecast.com slash submit. As of April 14th, we're paying three cents per word for stories that are approved and make it onto the show. Submission does not guarantee approval or payment. For a limited time only, PayPal only. Tales from the Break Room is an EerieCast network original podcast hosted by Darkness Prevails. You can follow him on Twitter at Dark Prevails, and you can hear thousands more stories read by him on our other show, Unexplained Encounters. If you enjoyed this episode, please follow and rate Tales from the Break Room on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. You can also enjoy plenty more horror-themed podcasts at EerieCast.com. <laughs>